Hi, gang, it's Adam. And Patrick. Coming up on today's episode, we head back to Disney's Animal Kingdom and explore Asia, Africa, Pandora, and even Rafiki's Planet Watch for part two of our feature segment, A Walk in the Park. As always, we cover the latest Disney news and close out the show with some quick D. All that and more on today's episode of Gaze Do the D. To all who come to this happy place, welcome. Patrick Fairy Core Kazaki. Ooh, that sounds sexual in a great way. <laughs> can I say that? I don't know if I can say that. We'll find out later. <laughs> There's no better way to start off any GDTD episode than by saying it's sexual. Yeah, yeah. That's what people think when they think of GDTD. Adam <laughs> Sivako Hummel. <gasps> Sivako, my friend. Sivako to you. Sivako. I got a little Sivako just right in the corner of my nose right here. Can you see it on cam? Oh, I can. I can. It needs to see that go away. You know? <laughs> Before we continue, I just need to let everyone know that my dog has decided to start chewing her fake bone right now. Mm. So you mm-hmm. may be hearing some penny chews in the background. Got it. Got it. I mean, it's just, it's simply a fact. Everyone out there who has a podcast or a YouTube channel knows that as soon as you hit record, the entire world explodes around you. That's absolutely correct. Patrick, how are you doing today? I am just delicious, Adam, just delicious. It's warm and sunny today. I went for a run. I'm feeling good, feeling fine. Did you have your guns out? Sun's out, guns out. <laughs> I had a gun out. Um, it wasn't, okay. it wasn't, it was on my person, but it wasn't my person. Okay. Oh, interesting. Is that how you normally run? Yeah, I like to run fully armed. <laughs> just <laughs> just makes me feel better, you know? Oh, <laughs> uh, I think a lot of people in this country would agree with you, my friend. <laughs> None of them listen to this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. How, <laughs> how are you, Adam? <laughs> I'm doing fantastic. Thank you for asking. Patrick, we need to say thank you to all of our listeners mm. who sent us their BuzzFeed quiz results from last week. We do. We do indeed. Thank you for taking part along with us. It seemed a lot of them were actually doing it as they were listening, which was fun, which was fun to know. Yeah, I love that kind of follow along method, you know, like just Mm -hmm. join the party, be part of the party. Come with us on this journey, please. Yeah, it it takes a lot of brain power. I frankly don't follow along uh, while we're recording, you know, (laughs) (laughs) I'm just all over the map usually. (laughs) You speak for both of us. I mean, come on. We're both just awful at listening to each other and really communicating. We're not good communicators, Patrick, so we thought we'd host a podcast. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're not great at recording, but excellent at editing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Turns out. <laughs> Turns out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. Yes. Well, thank you, everybody, for uh, following along with us on last week's episode. And we have to say, Adam, today, I believe, because our... Technically, our episodes drop on a Sunday evening is Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, everybody. Happy Mother's Day if you're listening to this on Sunday. And you know what? If you're not, happy Mother's Day any day because moms are the best. Happy Mother's always. Happy Mother's always. Patrick, how are you spending Mother's Day? How are you celebrating Pat? (laughs) Great question. Uh, My plan, though, usually foiled, is to wake up very early and get some donuts at the local bakery in the neighborhood and bring them over and then probably head over again later on that day for a a late lunch, early supper. That sounds fantastic. Yeah, just a a casual day in the neighborhood. I'm lucky... That my parents live right in the neighborhood, so I can literally just walk the dogs on over there. That's so, so nice. Well, happy Mother's Day, Pat. You are my mother from another (laughs) brother. That doesn't really work. That doesn't make any sense at all. How are you celebrating your Mrs. Hummel, Lady Hummel? if you will. (laughs) Before I get to that, I just want to mention that Matthew is downstairs talking. We're just going to continue because everything is just falling apart today. I am celebrating my mom by kind of doing a a similar thing. I'm going to have her over for some coffee and some danishes, and we're just going to get her really sugared up. 
you know, and just watch her run. She likes to eat a lot of sugar and just tear around the neighborhood. Perfect. I can see that. I can see that happening. Yeah, but it's just so nice to be in the same town with her so I can officially celebrate Mother's Day with her and my brother and sister-in-law and Matthew and Penny. The gang's all here, Patrick. I love it. I love it. As as we get older, Adam, now that we're we're girls of 25, 26, it's better to celebrate the family holidays, I feel like. Those are more meaningful to me now. Yeah. I mean, Christmas, though, you get presents. <laughs> but it's usually spent with family as well. <laughs> yes. Yes, absolutely. It's great to be with the fam. So happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there, to all of the sisters who are moms and dads who are moms and brothers and sisters and moms and aunts and uncles and everybody who fills that role. We love you. Mm -hmm. Everyone across the land, if you identify as a mother, we celebrate you. Another thing we need to celebrate, Patrick... Wow. Just wow. We have some new Patreon members. We sure do. I think I think doing a giveaway last week really perked some people's interest. <laughs> <laughs> we just enticed them. We said, come on in. Here's what you can expect. That's right. We dangled the carrot in the form of a shirt that nobody really wanted, but they got. They did win one. Someone got one. Tony got one. Congratulations, Tony. Congratulations, Tony, and welcome to the Patreon family, Michael, Allie, and Stephen. All three of them joined this past week. Three new Patreon family members. We are the luckiest guys in all the land. We are. We are indeed. We have the best Patreon members. They always are in contact with us, which is fantastic. They they are indeed our family members, as all of our Tweedles are. But our, our Patreon members are just, you know, a little extra special because they, they give us cash. They give us cash, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> they do do that, and we thank them so much for that. Patrick, if someone wants to join the Patreon fam, despite the fact that there's no giveaway this week, sorry about it, mm. how can they join that family? They can write a letter to Congress, Adam, and ask to join. They should do that. They should do that. There's a <laughs> lot of bills coming up that we need passed. You know, we need that voters bill passed. But getting back to the Patreon family, mm. Patrick, how can they join that? Mm. Well, speaking of bills, we have bills to pay. So please <laughs> head on over to, <laughs> to gazedothed.com. Click on that donate button, which will take you on over to our Patreon page where, say it with me, everybody, for as little as $1 reoccurring a month, you too can become a member of our Patreon family. Adam, tell the kids at home, what they get in return for uh, being so kind as to give us donations in kind. Yes, you will get, well, we can't guarantee national legislation. We just can't guarantee <laughs> that. We're just a simple podcast. But what we can guarantee you is exclusive access to Patreon-only episodes called Gays Do the D Raw and Uncut. Raw and Uncut. I like it was very ethereal, Patrick. Mm -hmm. I was going for Gladriel. Uh, from the Lord of the Rings on that one. You got it. You nailed it. You know what? There was a glow about you even when you said it. <laughs> I'm just doing my best Kate Blanchett impersonation. <laughs> yes. So you'll get the episodes. What else do you get? You get exclusive access to Patreon-only giveaways like last week's giveaway. We gave away a t-shirt. And if you join at certain tiers, I believe it is the $25 level and above, Patrick? I believe that's correct. I simply can't be bothered to remember. Don't waste your time checking. Yeah. Um, if you join at the $25 level and above, then you get, after your second month as a Patreon member, you get special gifts sent to you in the mail. You do. You do indeed. In the postal mail. You, you also get, Adam, I will say, that warm feeling in your heart for supporting two gay idiots. That's right. A lot of people think that it's some kind of heart disease, but no, it's actually the knowledge that you have supported two gay dummies. It could be both. It could be both, but it's certainly that warm, fuzzy feeling. Check with your doctor. <laughs> I recommend that after every episode of Gays Do the D. Check with your doctor. You Probably know? a good idea. Maybe an exorcism is in order, too. <laughs> Get everybody. Get the doctors, get the clergy. Everyone needs to get involved in Gaze to the D. Just make sure you're in tip-top shape after you listen to this absolute mess. That's right. Get multiple vaccinations after our episodes. <laughs> <laughs> Just whatever they have available. Just get it. 
<laughs> yes, all of the vaccinations. <laughs> can't, you can't be too safe. Can't be too safe. <laughs> well, once again, thank you, Michael, Ellie, and Stephen. You are treasures in our heart, as are all of our Tweedles and, of course, all of our Patreon family members. And with that, Patrick, we have very little banter this week, which is actually probably a great thing because we're going to be walking through two ginormous continents. We're going to be traveling to another planet, (laughs) and we're going to go to Rafiki's Planet Watch in our feature segment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That train ride can take a long time. We both know it. All right. So (laughs) we're going to wrap up banter with This Week in Disney History. We sure are, Adam. We have some fun ones to talk about this week for Disney history. Let's dive right in. 54 years ago, on May 12th, 1967, the then governor of Florida, Claude R. Kirk Jr., that's a great name, signed legislation which enabled Walt Disney Productions to fully operate Walt Disney World. Now, this piece of legislation officially created the Reedy Creek Improvement District and, in turn, Lake Buena Vista and Bay Lake were established. The legislation also removed the burden of the taxpayers of Florida to spend money on Disney construction, and it allowed Disney to build without relying on the approval of state agencies. Though plans were, of course, already underway, the Disney company was now officially able to begin phase one of Walt Disney World with the construction of the Magic Kingdom, the Contemporary Resort, which was originally going to be called Tempo Bay Resort Hotel, and the Polynesian Resort. Tempo Bay, huh? (laughs) I like it. There's something satisfying about Tempo Bay. Especially in the early 70s, like, come on down to Tempo Bay, experience the magic. They certainly couldn't be bothered to say the full word contemporary, so they had to shorten it to Tempo. (laughs) They had a lot of projects going on, Patrick. They were building a magic kingdom. It's true. It's true. They could not be bothered. But what a fun what a fun little piece of trivia I thought. I love. I love learning that. I love learning anything you have to tell us about Disney history, Patrick. Well, buckle up, because here's some more Disney history for your nerves. 93 years ago, on May 11th, 1929, Margaret Carey was born in Los Angeles, California. Her given name was Peggy Lynch, but she changed it under the guidance of Eddie Cantor. Carey was a TV actor, appearing in shows like The Andy Griffith Show and The Lone Ranger. She was also a radio host, hosting the What's Up Weekly Ministry Loves Company radio show for 12 years, which connected her to to raising funds and awareness to over 200 nonprofit services. And for Disney, Margaret Carey was the OG Tinkerbell. She was cast as the reference model animators used to create the head fairy in charge for Disney's Peter Pan. Now, I implore all of you, if you've not seen pictures, go look up photos of Carey. It's absolutely amazing. Imagineers actually built life-size objects like that giant keyhole that she looks through in the movie and the sewing kit for the scene where Tinkerbell gets trapped in the jewelry box. Carrie also provided the voice and reference movements for the red-haired mermaid in the Neverland Lagoon. So you could also argue that perhaps she was the original Little Mermaid. And ironically, her very first role in film ever was as a fairy in A Midsummer Night's Dream in 1935. Wow. Was that the Mickey Rooney version? I don't know. I can't answer that for certain. Oh, I love that version. If you have not seen it, it is amazing. Margaret Carey, we owe you so much. Mainly, we need to thank you for your sass. <laughs> it's true. It's absolutely true. It's Those photos are really cool. And she actually wrote a book about her experience um, as Tinkerbell. So you should check that out as well. The photos are beautiful and super nostalgic and fun. If you love Disney history, check it out. You know, we talked about Mother's Day at the top of the show, Patrick. Your mom goes bananas for Tinkerbell. (laughs) She goes cuckoo bananas for Tinkerbell. It's her very favorite character. And I always get a little emotional when I see Tinkerbell in the parks because it makes me think of my mother as well. Oh, that's such a great little connection. I love that. It is. Aren't I the best? You are the best, PK. Thank you so much. Speaking of the best, we have another birthday, a big birthday to celebrate. 117 years ago, Adam, on May 11th, 1904, surrealist artist Salvador Dali was born in Catalonia, Spain. Now, Dali, of course, is widely known as one of the most important and certainly well-known painters of the 20th century. In 1945, Walt Disney collaborated with Salvador Dali on the animated short Destino, which incidentally is the Spanish word for destiny. 
the production was ultimately put on hold for 58 years <laughs> and was finally, finally released in 2003. We could do an entire episode, I think, of Gaze to the D on, on this project, Destino and Salvador Dali's experience with Disney. And of course, the new Grand Destino Tower within Coronado Springs at Walt Disney World is highly inspired by Salvador Dali's art and his lifelong friendship with Walt Disney, which is absolutely beautiful it's one of my favorite places to stay though i have to i'll say this the resort itself is a bit confusing with the grounds at coronado springs having more of a mexican and a bit of a south american vibe to it and then the tower is more of a spanish vibe which listen that's i guess a problem for another day you know (laughs) (laughs) we are celebrating several cultures when we stay at that (laughs) resort i think is the best way we can put that we are. Yeah, just think of it that way. And and not that Disney thinks that all people who are Hispanic are the same. <laughs> Have you checked out the short on Disney Plus? It's so beautiful. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. It's I think it's only like six minutes long. So 58 years for six minutes, you know? totally worth it. And I have to say, that is a fever dream. I mean, Mm. obviously, if you know Dolly's work, you know that it is melting clocks, right? Mm -hmm. And like, just very surrealist. So as you can imagine, the collaboration between Walt Disney and Dolly was equally as bonkers and beautiful. Oh, yeah, absolutely, for sure. Part of the reason why it was put on hold was financially, of course, during the time they just didn't quite have the funds. But also, I think that they sort of realized the world maybe wasn't ready to see it yet. It was just, it wasn't quite (laughs) a Disney cartoon at the time. Now I think they can get away with a lot more. And that's part of why they held on to it for for a bit of time. Yeah, definitely a passion project between the two gentlemen at the time it was being created. And now you're right, we are kind of more welcoming of different forms of animation and different experiences while we're watching animation. It's not just quote unquote for kids anymore, right? This is a serious, legitimate art form that we celebrate not only when we watch movies, but we celebrate it with awards now too. I mean, it is quite the art form in today's world. It certainly is. So with that, happy birthday, Salvador Dali. And that wraps up this week in Disney history. I'm going to go bake him a melting cake. It's just going to be a mess of a cake. And not because I'm not a good baker, but because Mm. I want to pay tribute to Dali. It feels like a good excuse to show the world what your actual cakes look like. Also a good excuse to eat cake. Any day is a good excuse to eat cake, but specifically on Salvador Dali's birthday. Any day is also a good excuse to talk about Disney news, Patrick. Any day, every day, all day long. Just talk about the news. And much like my baking skills, this next segment will be an absolute mess. I guarantee it. We guarantee it. (laughs) We are in the middle of May, which of course means that Halloween is mere minutes away. (laughs) Minutes away. And Disney, to be sure, has already begun to celebrate with their halfway to Halloween festivities. That's right. Last week, May 7th, officially marked halfway to Halloween. And we have some exciting Disney announcements to make. The community demanded it, and Disney answered. This year, Disney World will be celebrating Halloween again at the Magic Kingdom. That's right, everyone. We're saying Halloween again within the Magic Kingdom. Oh, what a relief. I I felt (laughs) so tortured by the fact that I couldn't say Halloween in the Magic Kingdom. And now... Thanks to the current administration, I feel (laughs) safe again to say Halloween in the Magic Kingdom. It's safe. It's safe again to say Halloween. We were stifled, but now you are free to say so. Though, of course, it will look a little different than in years past. This year's celebration will be called Disney After Hours Boo Bash. I think they could have come up with something a little better (laughs) than Boo Bash, but... Listen, listen, we have Halloween again, so let's just be grateful. Who are we to provide commentary on the name, Patrick? (laughs) I think we above anyone should be providing commentary on Boo Bash. Boo Bash. You know, gays don't love a bash, but uh, no. they do love a boo bash. No, yeah, a boo boo, bash. Put, make sure that boo is in front of that bash. You know what I'm saying? Put a distinct space in between those two words, everybody. <laughs> Otherwise, 
<laughs> not not safe for work. All right. So this will be a special ticketed event with no need for a park pass reservation. The event will be held on select nights from August 10th through October 31st. Anyone with a ticket will be allowed into Magic Kingdom as early as 7 p.m. And the event will officially be from 9 p.m. to 12 a.m., though there will be select nights in August and September that will go from 9.30 p.m. to 12.30 a.m. Who can say why? Now, here's what you can expect at the bash. Halloween-themed cavalcades and character sightings throughout the park, candy stops, performances like the cadaver dance, specially themed foods and beverages for purchase, and, of course, Disney's unique Halloween lighting and park soundtrack specifically designed for the event. Also, a handful of attractions will be up and running, like the Haunted Mansion and Space Mountain, but they have not yet released the full list or if any of them will get a Halloween overlay this year. Specific dates have also not yet been released, nor have ticket prices, but we do know that tickets will be on sale this June, with an early purchase window available for guests with reservations at select Disney World hotels. Chris from Wishful Thinking, if you're listening, please, please give us some more details as we don't know much yet. How much do you think the tickets are going to be for this, Patrick? It's hard to know. I feel like they have to take into consideration you're not going to get photos with the characters, likely. You're not going to get a stage show, likely, or a parade, likely. And it's only three hours. So (laughs) I feel like if they're going to be charging anything more than $75, they may have missed the mark on this one. That's exactly where I was going to land, like around $75. I'm curious how many more attractions are going to be open because I've gone to a Disney After Dark event before. And in those three hours, you can hit up everything you want to do with the limited capacity in the park. Yeah, you can absolutely do that. And speaking of limited capacity, who can say how many tickets are even going to be selling for this event? If they're going to go full capacity for a party or if it's half capacity, who who knows? It's all up in the air for sure. But we do know, knock on wood, that it is happening this year at least. Who knows? That is the question. Disney doesn't even know. I think they're just kind of saying there's going to be an event and they're going to play it by ear as – COVID cases continue to decline and more people get vaccinated. Maybe this will even expand a bit more. We just don't know at this point. Exactly, exactly. Well, here's some things that we do know, however, Adam. If you're ready to start celebrating Halloween right now, head on over to Disney Parks blog and check out their newly released spooky recipes, along with an opportunity to pre-order the soon-to-be-released Disney Villains Devilishly Delicious Cookbook. You'll also find a curated list of Halloween-themed movies and TV shows available on Disney+, and of course, a link to the Disney Halloween playlist on Apple Music or Spotify. And be very very sure to check out the just-released YouTube video, A Self-Guided Tour of the Most Mystifying Attractions Around the World, hosted by the Muppet's own Uncle Deadly. Within the video, you'll be able to select a behind-the-scenes glimpse at one of four attractions around the world. The Haunted Mansion at both Disney World and Disneyland, Mystic Manor at Hong Kong Disney, and Phantom Manor at Disneyland Paris. And be sure to watch until the end for a special sneak peek at the upcoming Disney Plus special, Muppets Haunted Mansion. I cannot wait for Muppets Haunted Mansion, Patrick. I don't know what it is. I don't care. It takes two of my favorite things, the Muppets and the Haunted Mansion, and it mashes them together. What a delight. Yeah, I'm actually super excited about this. This feels like a Muppets sweet spot, you know? I think it's going to be fantastic and a great way to celebrate the season and the Muppets, who, as we mentioned on the podcast before, have gotten very little love or very little attention from Disney. It's true. They don't They don't know what to do with those Muppets, but maybe scaring people with the Muppets is the way to go. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try it. <laughs> Just in time for Pride Month 2021. By the way, where's our halfway to Pride, Disney? <laughs> It's always halfway to Pride. (laughs) (laughs) So just in time for Pride Month 2021, Disney is celebrating LGBTQ plus Pride with all new bespoke products featuring Disney and for the first time ever, other iconic brands as well. The products are available now at ShopDisney.com and Disney stores in North America and Japan, Walt Disney World Resort and Disneyland Resort. And the collection is coming later this month to Disney stores in Europe. Europe and shopdisney.co.uk. The collection includes 
Oh, get ready for this. It's a huge list this year. An adorable Mickey Mouse love tee for both adults and kids. A Mickey Mouse heart-shaped hands t-shirt for adults. And an all-over print face mask. I'm going to read this next copy straight off the Disney Parks blog, Patrick. Quote, And if you're a Mickey Mouse fan, you simply must have a Mickey Mouse fan perfect for a little shade or breath of fresh air, end quote. They know exactly who they're talking to, and it's me. They fully leaned in to talking about shade. (laughs) I love it. I love it. Well done, everybody. Also included are a rainbow baseball hat featuring Mickey's silhouette and the latest mini backpack from Loungefly with an all-over Mickey and Minnie print wearing their best rainbow looks against a white background. Also available, Patrick, as a wristlet. I know you love wristlets. Can't get enough of them. Can't get enough of them. Who can? The now iconic Mickey Mouse pride ears have been given a retro twist for this year's collection. The navy headpiece is emblazoned with a retro Mickey Mouse patch. There's also a fashionable belt bag that can double as a crossbody bag, a zip-up hoodie and jogger pants, and you can accessorize every single thing I've already listed with a transgender flag pin. That's right, you heard that correctly. Disney has released a transgender flag pin or one of Disney's other pride pins. Amazing. Amazing. Well, I mean, I'm I'm so proud that Disney is like just embracing all of this now. Absolutely. But that's not all, Patrick. Disney is also serving us a lively phone case featuring classic park icons available only at Walt Disney World Resort and Disneyland Resort. An adorable and updated Mickey and Minnie plush and pride merch celebrating Pixar and Star Wars. And retailers like Amazon, Box Lunch, Funko, Kohl's, and Torrid will be celebrating with their own items licensed from Disney. Funko will have a plethora of new pop vinyl rainbow figures, including Stitch, Patrick, I know you're going to get Stitch, and Wally, a Funko.com exclusive, plus an Ursula pop vinyl figure a Hot Topic exclusive coming in June. All of those just too adorable to pass up. So there are plenty of ways to show off your LGBTQ and Disney pride this year. Patrick, what is calling to you? Oh, to be sure, I've already made some purchases, Adam. (laughs) (laughs) Of course you have. Of course you have. Of course I have. I bought a baby onesie for myself and then one for (laughs) my my new nephew who was just born recently. Uh, And I I may or may not have purchased the hoodie. I can't remember. I throw things in a cart and then I just press purchase. That is a Jesus take the wheel moment. It is full on (laughs) Patrick at his finest shopping till he drops and just going for it. That's right. That's absolutely right. Adam and Tweedles, I have a few Disney World updates for everyone. This past week, Florida's Governor Ratcliffe. I'm so sorry. (laughs) Governor DeSantis Uh, (laughs) signed an executive order immediately suspending all COVID-19 health restrictions, even though Florida has reported the third highest amount of COVID-19 cases in the country since the pandemic began. Now, as I said, the executive order is effective immediately and will become law on July 1st, just before a holiday that attracts the biggest crowds of the year. Smart, smart plan. (laughs) Disney World has responded to this executive order with a no ma'am. No ma'am. No (laughs) ma'am. Immediately following the announcement, immediately following the announcement of the executive order, Disney World released the following statement. We are aware of the state of Florida's plans announced today to modify COVID-19 guidelines. We will evaluate this latest guidance and maintain our current health and safety measures at this time, including face covering requirements. We will continue to make thoughtful adjustments to our policy. As COVID-19 vaccines become available, we encourage people to get vaccinated, which is a powerful statement right now from a company to be encouraging people to get vaccinated when their own government in Florida is not encouraging people to get vaccinated. Can you imagine what it must have been like for Disney after that signing? Just like now they have to release a statement clarifying their position and reiterating safety protocols they've already had in place. 
yeah, it's it's all very confusing, and I don't envy um, the citizens of Florida right now for being torn between the two, the government and and Disney and all the other businesses that have to make very tough decisions now because they have just been left out to dry, basically. So <laughs> that being said, Disney does, however, have plans in place to begin relaxing their restrictions. So starting this May 16th, temperature screenings will no longer be a requirement to enter the parks, restaurants, or Disney Springs, a.k.a. Disney's Petri Dish. This <laughs> adjustment was made under the advisement of the CDC. Moving on, Disney World is bringing back a few fan-favorite dining destinations. Starting on May 16th, Chef Mickey's will once again be open for dinner and will include a no-touch character experience with Mickey and friends, <laughs> which, you know, it's perfect for me because all of my dates are no-touch experiences. <laughs> you would never get a date with Mickey. <laughs> That's true. That's true. He would he would be slumming if he went on a date with me, that's for sure. For sure. Oh, boy. Starting on May 18th, guests can once again enjoy a meal at Cape May Cafe at the Beach Club Resort. The restaurant will be open for breakfast and dinner. However, for the time being, Minnie's Beach Bash Breakfast and the Seafood and More Buffet will not be available. Seafood and More. That's not an appealing title. I got to say, Patrick, I've stayed at the Beach Club and I've smelled the aftermath of that <laughs> dining experience. Oh, that's a bummer. That's a real bummer. <laughs> I can confirm seafood is involved. <laughs> and more. And more. And the more, more the more comes after. That's <laughs> that's an after experience. <laughs> oh, we have to move on. So also opening sometime this summer. Tusker House will reopen with a modified, again, no-touch character experience. No specific date has been set yet for this reopening. And last but certainly not least, Disney has announced that starting this June, they will be bringing back the Disney College program. This past May 3rd, students whose program either ended early or was suspended received an email inviting them to reapply and rejoin the program. Students accepted into the program will be the first members of this program to live in the new Flamingo Crossing Village Complex, which opened this past December to cast members. Safety measures will be put in place for anyone living in the complex, with mask mandates in common areas, and fully vaccinated program members will have the option to live with other fully vaccinated members. Along with the announcement of the return of the Disney College program, Disney also announced plans to expand the program in the near future to include an international exchange program, a culinary program, and a Disneyland program. To learn more about the DCP, go to jobs.disneycareers.com slash Disney programs. And speaking of Disneyland, we should add on, I know this was a Walt Disney World kind of update, but... Mm. I read that Disneyland is now offering vaccine to its cast members and their family members through a special code, and they're going to be vaccinating the cast members at the Disneyland Hotel. That is fantastic. Good job, Disney. You are on top of it, ahead of it, I would say. You are ahead of it. It just feels like they're taking the right precautions, but kind of being cautiously optimistic and moving forward and reopening some of these dining locations that are so, so popular in Walt Disney World. Yes, absolutely. I, I have to go back to that statement that they made, which I just is so encouraging. The, the, the sentence specifically, we will continue to make thoughtful adjustments to our policy is, is encouraging to me as someone who wants to visit Disney more often that they are taking, you know, they're, they're using judgment when making these, these changes, which, you know, not a lot of people are. Not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Star Wars and Marvel, Patrick, they don't get mashed up. A lot, but you know what? We are forward thinking here on GDTD, and I'm just going to smash these next two stories together if it kills me. I'm very excited. I hope it doesn't kill you. It just hurts you a little bit. It will. Mm -hmm. It will. Last week, as part of its May the 4th celebration, Disney updated Star Wars fans on the status of the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser coming to Walt Disney World Resort in Florida, not in 2021, 
but now in 2022. Yes, Disney pushed back the opening, and we're guessing the pandemic may have had something to do with that. (laughs) Disney teased a new type of lightsaber created by Walt Disney Imagineering Research and Development. Guests who experience Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser, those rich, rich people, will be the first (laughs) to see it in action. Disney also announced and shared concept art for the Crown of Corellia Dining Room, a bright and welcoming hall that will offer breakfast and lunch to passengers before transitioning each evening into a lavish multi-course menu of both otherworldly and familiar origins, featuring performances by a galactic superstar singing sensation. And if you would like to audition for that role, awesome transition. Adam, Disney is seeking actors, stunt performers, and musicians to portray characters aboard the Galactic Star Cruiser. Among the roles Disney is casting, listen up, Patrick, one of these could suit you perfectly. The captain, the cruise director, ship mechanic, saber trainer, the aforementioned Galactic Superstar, whom the casting notice describes as, quote, a phenomenally soulful singer who demands focus in every conversation and performance alike. Her vocal range is preferably that of a mezzo-soprano, and her musical style is a hybrid of neo-soul, jazzy, funk, colored by her extensive travel and experiences, end quote. Patrick, right up your alley. Yeah, this will be my last episode of Gaze to the D, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so confident you're going to get that role. Disney is also casting some characters named Ray and Kylo Ren and never heard of them. Disney is seeking online submissions at this time. To learn more or to apply, visit jobs.disneycareers.com slash auditions. Moving to Marvel, a couple of stories here. As Disneyland Resort ramps up for the opening of Avengers Campus on June 4th, Marvel has been busy promoting a number of upcoming projects and reminding us just how expansive its cinematic universe is. Last week, Marvel released a sizzle reel of upcoming projects entitled Marvel Studios Celebrates the Movies, and we got our first glimpse of Academy Award-winning director Chloe Zhao's The Eternals. Emphasis on the glimpse, we didn't really learn anything, but we were reminded how gorgeous the cast is, featuring Kit Harington, Gemma Chan, Kumail Nanjiani, Salma Hayek, Angelina Jolie. I could go on and on and on. On top of that, Disney and Marvel announced last week that the upcoming Disney Plus series Loki will be released early earlier, or a bit earlier, rather, originally slated to premiere on Friday, June 11th. Loki will now debut on Wednesday, June 9th, with subsequent episodes released on Wednesdays instead of Fridays. Loki is the third flagship Marvel Studios show to hit Disney+, Plus, following WandaVision and The Falcon and the Winter Soldier. And to wrap up this week's marvelous news, Disneyland Resort released images of the costumes cast members will be sporting when Avengers Campus opens. Cast members at Web Slingers, a Spider-Man adventure, will wear costumes that feature modern, techie emblems and materials made of lightweight, breathable fabrics that stretch for movement. What are they going to be doing? And flexibility and the Web Spider logo across their shirts, coats, and even hats. Cast members working at PIM Test Kitchen will be wearing lab coats and PIM pocket protectors, love that alliteration, Disney, and have PIM particles featured on their hats and neckties. Over at the Ancient Sanctum, cast members will layer unique pieces that cast a dramatic silhouette with rich textures and sewing techniques inspired by the mystic arts. And as for the food carts in Avengers Campus, cast members will wear unique aprons corresponding to their current location. One apron is inspired by classic New York food carts for Shawarma Palace and for Terran Treats. The costume is inspired by Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout. Back at Avengers Headquarters, the campus uniforms include cargo bottoms, a training shirt, and a tactical-inspired vest that are comfortable, lightweight, and breathable, so the cast can be ready to take on any mission that comes their way, Patrick. Sounds like they're ready for action. You know, they're ready to get active in that Marvel's Avengers Campus. 
Yeah, all those stretchy fabrics and breathable <laughs> fabrics. They're going to be stretching and breathing. <laughs> so many lunges and high kicks, I'm imagining, from the cast members. That's exactly what they're going to be doing as they load you into the ride vehicles, just mm. lunging and high kicking. I'm here for it, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Remember episode 133? <laughs> I do, in fact. I do remember. Oh, really? What happened in that episode, friend? I assume we were going to Animal Kingdom, unless this is a trick question. <laughs> that was a test, and you passed it. Got it. Got it. Phew. That's right. In episode 133, we took part one of our A Walk in the Park, Disney's Animal Kingdom, and we covered, oh my gosh, so much, the park entrance, the Oasis, Discovery Island, and Dinoland USA. And now, Patrick, it is finally time for part two. And today, as I mentioned at the top of the episode, we're going to be traveling two continents. We're going to be traveling to a whole other planet and to Rafiki's planet. Watch. <laughs> the most magical place on Earth. Of any Disney park, really, wouldn't you say? I would say. I did say. I would say. I will say. For those of you that haven't listened to a Walk in the Park segment before, this just gives Patrick and I a chance to relive our favorite locations in Disney parks by strolling through any given area during any given episode. And this week, we're going to be covering Asia, Africa, Pandora, and Rafiki's Planet Watch. I mean, you keep teeing it up to be a disappointment, but I think, <laughs> I think we're in for a real good time. And we should say before we begin, this segment assumes that the pandemic is no longer an issue. We can't guarantee that all of these attractions and experiences will be returning, but this is just normal park operating status. That's right. We'll, we'll cover everything that exists within, well, Everything is a is a tough sell, but we're most things that we can remember that exist within Animal Kingdom, and we'll be sure to mention here and there if we if we know for sure if something is closed right now. But we'll talk about it as though it's open. That's right. So, Patrick, we got to kick this thing off because we have a lot of ground to cover. We have a lot. We have a lot. If you'll remember, Tweedles, when last we met in the Animal Kingdom, Adam had just reminded us how much he despises Dinoland <laughs> USA, wants it to burn down, uh, and, and now we're going to continue on our journey. <laughs> I don't remember being so passionate about mm. it burning down, but mm -hmm. if that is the case, I hope no one is hurt, and I hope they immediately build Zootopia Land in its place. <laughs> it's a controlled burn. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so we're going to pick up naturally kind of like in the history of the timeline of the earth that goes dinosaurs, fish, yeti. That's kind of like, you know, that that drawing of of man, you know, becoming mm. man. That's where we're at. So fish, we got to cover fish, Patrick. Let's get into it. Let's dive right in. Oh, Patrick. Yes. So if you haven't guessed by now, we're talking about Finding Nemo the Musical, a 40-minute musical version of the award-winning Disney and Pixar film, which includes extraordinary live musical performances, delightful puppets, vibrant sets, and wondrous underwater special effects that immerse guests in Nemo's fantastic world, Patrick. Oh, that was a joy. That was a real joy. I didn't write it. Disney did. Guests can join the overprotective clownfish Marlin and his forgetful friend Dory as they search for his son Nemo. The multiple Academy Award winning songwriting team behind Frozen and Coco, Robert Lopez and Kristen Anderson Lopez created 14 original songs just for this show. The first time a non-musical Disney animated feature has been transformed into an original musical production. Patrick, how do you feel about Finding Nemo the Musical? Finding Nemo grew on me over the years. When I first saw it, I didn't. I was like, mm, "This is fun," but I think I, I had ruined it because I saw The Lion King first, the Festival oh, of the Lion King, yeah, yeah. and that just that blew me away. And so 
this it's great like if you really sit down and 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 ease into it and watch it for what it is it's actually a really beautiful uh piece of theater it is a beautiful piece of theater in fact it's like broadway caliber level of production behind it and the cast is so so talented yeah amazingly talented cast beautiful sets and props and costumes across the board the music's great i didn't know there were 14 songs that's a lot and you will absolutely be humming them as you continue your walk around the park for sure. So if you have a chance and have not seen it, it's also a nice break from a busy park day. Check out Finding Nemo the musical. Assuming it's coming back. We don't have confirmation on that yet. (laughs) No confirmation. Assuming it's coming back. That's absolutely right. And just across the path from Finding Nemo is seating for the now closed nighttime spectacular lagoon show Rivers of Light. More on that in a bit. But let's cross into Asia, Patrick. It's a huge continent. It's a huge area of the park. Asia opened in 1999 as the park's first expansion land. And it contains a huge attraction. On our right is Expedition Everest. We'll get to that, but first let's do some shopping. Just a quick shopping trip, Patrick, at Circa Zong Bazaar, which contains Himalayan, Yeti, and Disney character merchandise. Love it. Love it. I love the shops within Animal Kingdom specifically because they're so specific to the area within the park itself, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And Circa Zong Bazaar is what I like to call an adrenaline come down because you get spilled into it after Expedition Everest. And man, I'm just flying after that attraction. Yeah, it's it's actually the exit into gift shop from the ride. But you can go in there without having gone on Expedition Everest. That's a great point. That's the kind of level of detail we demand from you, Patrick. <laughs> if it's if it's got something to do with shopping, I'm all in. <laughs> all right, let's talk about Expedition Everest, Legend of the Forbidden Mountain. The best coaster in Walt Disney World, Patrick, would you say? Bold statement, but I will agree with you. Thank you. That's why we're friends. Riders careen through icy Himalayan peaks on a speeding train while avoiding the clutches of the mythic Yeti. The attraction features loud noises, fast drops, high speeds, dark places, and frightening creature effects. Imagine if they fully worked. The grand opening was on April 7th, 2006. It is a steel coaster built by... Vekoma or Vikoma? It is the tallest coaster and mountain in any Disney park at 199.5 feet. It beats the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror for tallest attraction in Disney World by six inches. Disney keeps all of its attraction buildings, as we know, under 200 feet because aviation law requires structures of that height and taller to have a blinking red light at the top of the attraction or building, and Disney doesn't want that to ruin the aesthetic of the attraction. The 2011 edition of Guinness World Records lists Expedition Everest as the most expensive roller coaster in the world. Its total cost was reported to be $100 million, and it took six years of planning and construction. It held that record up until 2019 when the $300 million attraction Hagrid's Magical Creatures Motorbike Adventure opened at Universal's Islands of Adventure. Expedition Everest required more than 38 miles of rebar, Patrick, 5,000 tons of structural steel, and 10,000 tons of concrete. Yeah, the the stats behind this coaster are incredible and and at the time one of a kind like groundbreaking entertainment coasterness is that a word i don't know coasterness absolutely mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. as of this recording expedition everest remains the last major attraction built at the walt disney world resort to not be based on an intellectual property a few months after the ride opened in 2006 the yeti figures framing split threatening catastrophic malfunction if it were to be operated further in A mode. Since then, it has been operating only in the alternative B mode, in which a strobe light effect is used to give the appearance of movement, earning it the nickname Disco Yeti from some fans. Get down, Disco Yeti. Joe Rohde, the Imagineer in charge of building the attraction and Animal Kingdom, was asked about the Yeti at the 2013 D23 Expo, Here's what he said, Patrick, quote, you have to understand it's a giant complicated machine sitting on top of like a 46 foot tall tower in the middle of a finished building. So it's really hard to fix, but we are working on it and we continue to work on it. I will fix the Yeti someday, I swear, end quote. 
Rhodey retired from Disney Imagineering in <laughs> January of this year. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> so Joe Rody has promised to fix the attraction. We'll see if it ever happens. But even if the Yeti isn't working, Expedition Everest is still a heck of an attraction. Oh yeah. I mean this is is this the thrill ride, I would say, within the the Walt Disney World theme parks. And Pro Rider tip? Take advantage of that single rider line. There's not a ton of single rider lines in Disney World. It's just to the right of the entrance to the queue for Expedition Everest. True story. You'll get on the ride like within 10 minutes if you use that single rider line. Across from the entrance to Expedition Everest sits the mammoth 5,000-seat amphitheater for Animal Kingdom's nighttime spectacular, which doesn't exist. Rivers of Light used to be performed on the lagoon, but the spectacular closed in March of 2020, a closure actually unrelated to the pandemic, despite the timing. So we'll just have to wait and see what Disney comes up with next to utilize the amphitheater and the lagoon. Moving on, we have the Circa Cart, where you can purchase more merch if the Circa Zong Bazaar didn't do it for you. And to our right is Thirsty River Bar and Trek Snacks. It's a quick service open air bar offering specialty drinks and beers, along with a selection of refreshing frozen beverages. You can choose from grab and go goodies like hummus and veggies and pita. Also, popcorn, Patrick, and sweet treats. The cost will run you about fourteen ninety nine and under per adult. You're going to be hearing me say that a lot as we trek through Asia. Yeah, kind of anything to eat within <laughs> those carts are fourteen ninety nine and down. That's right. Just past Thirsty River Bar and Trek Snacks is Anandapur Ice Cream Truck. You can grab a soft serve waffle cone or a frosty float with your choice of fountain beverage at this quick service location. Also serves beer. Again, will run you fourteen ninety nine and under per adult. And as we continue down the path, we pass some restrooms and come to a fantastic photo opportunity. The Everest Corner Outlooks gives you a fantastic view of Expedition Everest and includes a totem that, when aligned properly, matches the shape of the attraction. We also come upon some more merch offerings like Kali Cart and Mandala Gifts. There's also some amazing monkey watching and a Disney Vacation Club Information Center for all of you who are interested in DVC. And then we come upon another market area. On our left is the Royal Anandapur Tea Company and Drinkwalla. The Royal Anandapur Tea Company is a quick service location offering hot and cold teas and Joffrey's hot and iced coffee drinks and pastries. Again, running you $14.99 and under per adult. And Drink Walla is a quick service location offering assorted nuts, chips, and ice cold frozen beverages and more beer if you can take it. Again, $14.99 and under per adult. And to the right is one of the most popular dining locations in all of Animal Kingdom and a very popular dining location in all of Disney World. I'm talking about Yak and Yeti Restaurant. Patrick, have you ever dined at Yak and Yeti restaurant? I have not dined at Yak and Yeti. Either have I. We have to check this out when we go down for the 50th. I hear such great things about it. The themed table service dining location serves lunch and dinner featuring Pan-Asian food in a beautiful Nepalese-style restaurant. Yak and Yeti restaurant offers a menu of sweet and sour chicken, ahi tuna nachos, that sounds amazing right now, pork pot stickers, I'd also take on a plate of those, and Kobe beef burgers. There's also many vegetarian options and kid-friendly choices like tempura chicken, cheeseburgers, and mac and cheese. There's also, Patrick, unique alcoholic and non-alcoholic but why would you beverages like chilled sake, Asian beers, wine, and an assortment of hot teas. There's also, on top of all of that, sumptuous desserts like chocolate pudding cake, mango pie, or fried wontons served with fresh pineapple and ice cream, Patrick. Yes, please. I want that immediately. All of that immediately. Full disclosure, we are recording this during lunchtime. It is absolute torture. Yeah, I could I could take down a mango pie right now, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Lunch and dinner at Yak and Yeti restaurant will run you about $15 to $34.99 per adult. And advance reservations are highly recommended. Next door to Yak and Yeti restaurant is Yak and Yeti local foods cafe. It offers quick service fare for outdoor lunch 
lunch and dinner dining, like vegetable tikka masala, sweet and sour tempura shrimp, pork egg rolls, a kid's menu, and beer. The beer is not on the kid's menu, though, just FYI. In addition, everyone paying attention, Yak and Yeti Local Foods Cafe also offers breakfast. See, they do serve breakfast there, but you have to look for it. They serve a breakfast bowl to which you can add bacon or sausage and a sausage and egg English muffin or egg white English muffin, fruit salad, a yogurt parfait, and for the kids, or the kids at heart, pancakes, sausage, and French toast. Breakfast beverages include orange juice, apple juice, and coffee. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner will run you about fourteen ninety nine and under per adult. And Patrick, the Yak and Yeti franchises continue with Yak and Yeti, I'm going to butcher this, Bakhtapur Market, I think, where you can purchase art collectibles and housewares. And just beyond that, Yak and Yeti quality beverages, it does not end. A quick service location offering entrees like Asian chicken wrap, ginger chicken salad, or a turkey leg with chips, sides like egg rolls and smaller desserts, and beverages like beer, sangria, interesting, and specialty drinks like the Yak Attack, which is a mango daiquiri with rum and wild berry flavors, or the Frozen Emperor Margarita, and is also available in strawberry, mango, or wild berry. And a meal or drinks at Yak and Yeti Quality Beverages, again, fourteen ninety nine and under per adult. Never get tired of hearing that. Never, ever. You're a liar. I am. <laughs> All right, moving on to another attraction, one that I don't frequent or maybe have done once, I think really just once, Kali River Rapids, a whitewater adventure through a lush jungle in the heart of Asia where riders graze gushing waterfalls or just get sent right through them and bedrock amid the raging current. Then, as the harmony of nature is disrupted, plummet down a dramatic 20-foot slope. In keeping with Disney's Animal Kingdom's message of conservation and environmental protection, this attraction deals with illegal logging and habitat destruction. And Patrick, as I'm sure you know, you will get wet. You will more likely get soaked. Soaked to the bone. I've also never gone on this attraction. Fun fact, though, I've tried three times, and each time I try to go on this attraction, it breaks down. Oh my gosh, that's fascinating. Isn't it just? <laughs> I think it's I think it's the Disney gods and goddesses telling me, don't go on this attraction, Patrick, you will die. You did not bring a change of dry shoes. Do not go on this attraction, Patrick. Yes, and I always listen to the Disney gods and goddesses. Smart man. That's why you are my podcasting partner. I would recommend if you do plan to go on it and it doesn't break down, <laughs> please wear a waterproof poncho or bring extra clothes or, as I said, bring extra shoes to change into after riding because you will get very, very wet. There are lockers for mobile devices and other items you want to stay dry, and they're located across from the entrance to Kali River Rapids and are available during your ride on a first-come, first-served basis. So moving on, we have some restrooms and an animal relief area that I was not aware of, Patrick. Do you think all the animals in Animal Kingdom use that one relief area? I know I do. Gross? I mean... Yeah, <laughs> it is. That's why you've never been on Kali River Rapids, because they see you coming and they're like, that's the guy that poops in the animal relief area. That's right. That's why I'm always immediately kicked out of Animal Kingdom within hours. <laughs> We're coming up to another attraction, one of my favorite attractions in Animal Kingdom. I've talked about it on the podcast several times, and that's the Maharaja, or Maharaja, if you're the Duke in mm -hmm. Moulin Rouge, Jungle Trek. Legend has it, Patrick, that the Anandapur Royal Forest was once the hunting ground of wealthy Maharajas. Today, thankfully, it's a lush tropical paradise guests can explore on a self-guided tour. Now, I always call this the Amanda Lepore trek. Uh, that's a very different attraction, and mm -hmm. it can only be found in L.A. <laughs> just as exciting, though. Just as exciting and twice as wild. Yeah, grab a fast pass for that one, for <laughs> sure. Patrick, the Maharaja Jungle Trek features Asian tigers. Rare. <laughs> <laughs> As with any of these lists, I have to get Patrick's reaction. Gibbons. I'm a monkey. There you go. Eld's deer. 
Bah. I don't okay, know. sure. Black buck. Nay. Is it a horse? I don't know what it is. Here we go. Keep going. Yeah. Komodo dragon. You know this one, right? Mm, ribbit. Maybe you don't. The Malayan flying fox. <laughs> this brings me such joy. Water buffalo. Brown buffalo. Yep. And an aviary featuring over 50 species of birds. Yeah. Perfect. You nailed that one for sure. You're, keep, you're still going okay? Are you done? Mm. There we go. The aviary can be quite terrifying. <laughs> yes, I have been dive bombed by many a birds within the aviary. But it is a fantastic experience, and I know it's tucked back in there. It's really easy to miss, but if you have a chance, your kids will absolutely love it. I guarantee you. Check out the Maharaja Jungle Trek. It is not only beautiful to witness the animals, but also the theming in that area is exceptional. It is really beautiful, and oftentimes not a lot of people are going through it for some reason. Because they're dummies. Because <laughs> they're dum dums. Moving on, we come upon the Anandapur. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I'm probably just murdering it. It's it's Amanda Lapur. Uh, the Amanda Lapur Theater, which. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, that seems so wrong. That's so wrong. And so right. The Anandapur Theater currently features Feathered Friends in Flight, which is a 25-minute show at the Caravan Stage, which is outside of the theater. So the, the theater itself is currently not open, but the Caravan Stage outside the theater is Feathered Friends in Flight features animal behavior specialists offering a behind-the-scenes look at the free-flying birds of Disney's Animal Kingdom. Guests learn how they can care for and train the park's feathered friends. And as for inside the theater, it's currently vacant, as I said, but prior to the pandemic, Up, a great bird adventure, was performing multiple times a day. The 25-minute show featured Russell and Doug from Pixar's Up learning about bird species from around the world. And do we have any word if that's returning, Patrick? Do we know? I believe it is. I feel like last time I was there, this, this past month, it looked like they were playing around with partially opening it and doing some of the new bird show within the theater itself on stage with very limited seating. So I think, I think they're figuring it out right now to see what they can still do. I've actually never seen any of the bird shows in the theater. Hmm. And that's the end of my sentence. <laughs> <laughs> it is actually really great. It's a nice um, escape. I think it's it's outside, so don't expect air conditioning. Um, but it is really beautiful. And they have so many majestic birds to see up close and personal. Mm, Patrick approved. All right. Got to check that out. So moving on from the theater, we have Warring Outpost, a quick service cart featuring snacks like a Mickey pretzel with cheese, margaritas. Margaritas aren't a snack. They're an entree. And wine and beer, again, running you fourteen ninety nine and under per adult. Directly across the path from the cart is a character meet and greet location where you can usually find King Louie and Baloo on a dock. Adorable. Those are some of my favorite character meet and greets when they are available. They are fantastic costumes. Great character meet and greet. And before we leave Asia, can you believe it? We're almost there. We have two last quick service locations to hit up. Mr. Kamal's, which offers seasoned fries. Yes, that's right. Seasoned fries with dipping sauces like saffron, aioli, honey, kimchi, ketchup, and tandoori honey, mustard, I'm starving. It also offers hummus with vegetables and pita and assorted beverages. Patrick, care to take a stab at how much these items may cost you? $57. Absolutely incorrect. $14.99 per adult. There's also Caravan Road, which offers snacks like a ginger slaw dog and pork with sticky rice. Man, does that sound good on a hot day. And beverages, again, running you $14.99 and under per adult. And with that, Patrick, we have completed our trek through Asia in Disney's Animal Kingdom. So much, so much to do and see in Asia. It's beautiful there. If if nothing else, if you're not going to go on any attractions, if you're not going to do shopping, if you're not going to eat, just look at the at the, the set decoration, for lack of a better phrase. It is 
it is themed out so well and so beautiful and and the soundtrack behind it is great too i love i love the asia portion of animal kingdom you are absolutely right the ambiance in asia and in particular at night i mean all of disney's animal kingdom at night is gorgeous but in asia with the lights strung across the pathways and the hanging flags just so beautiful it's it's absolutely picturesque for sure and you know that because so many selfies are taken there <laughs> And as you said, Adam, this now brings us to our next portion of Animal Kingdom. We're heading into Africa. I think I think this is probably my favorite portion of the park within Animal Kingdom. The level of detail in Africa is astonishing. They thought of every single thing. It is absolutely believable. Absolutely. Absolutely. So again, as you pass over the river that connects Asia and Africa, both in real life and within Disney World, you <laughs> you immediately start to hear the drums and music that, for me, makes Africa my favorite section in Animal Kingdom. It's such a happy and vibrant and joyous section of the park, I would say. So the entire portion of the park that makes up Africa has a complete story to it that basically centers around the main attraction here, the Kilimanjaro Safari. So as you enter, you are welcomed into the fictional East African village called Harambe, which is a Swahili word meaning working together, which is the overall theming here and messaging. It's all about unity and working together as a community. Within Africa, you're going to find lots and lots of places to eat, just like Asia, most of which are food carts, and also lots and lots of things to purchase. In fact, the first thing you'll find as you enter Harambe is a food cart called Mahindi, where you can get beverages, including a few beers and popcorn. This is usually, fun fact, one of the few spots within Animal Kingdom where you can get one of the specialty popcorn buckets that are available seasonally. Which makes sense, because from what I understand, Mahindi actually means corn in Swahili. Oh, I learned something today. Learning things while I speak. Who would have thought? (laughs) Just just across from here, you'll find Tamu Tamu refreshments. Now, Tamu is the Swahili word for sweet. And here you can find some of Disney's specialty desserts, including a Dole Whip, a Dole Whip float, a warm brownie sundae, or a Simba sunset, which is a pineapple Dole Whip with watermelon, strawberry, and coconut syrup. And across from here, you'll find the Dawa Bar, which is a bamboo bar with outside covered seating. Now, interestingly, Disney fully gets me because Dawa in Swahili means medicine. So here you can get (laughs) your medicine in the form of beer and cocktails. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) That is such a funny little touch. I, I absolutely laughed when I learned that that Dawa means medicine. So drinks or medicine include margaritas, a Harambe iced tea, which is basically a Long Island iced tea, a Lost on Safari, which is a rum punch, basically, and the Numu jungle juice, which is the famous jungle juice from Tusker House, mixed with peach schnapps and vodka. You can also get medicinal beers like the Tusker Lager, the Victoria Golden Monkey Triple Ale, and the Old Elephant Foot IPA, which is one of my favorite beers within the Animal Kingdom. Now, connected to the Dawa Bar is the very popular Tusker House, which, as we mentioned before, is unfortunately closed right now, but it does plan to open later this summer. When it is up and running, Tusker House is a fan-favorite character dining experience for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You can meet classic Disney characters like Mickey and Minnie in their safari outfits. It was buffet style, so we're not really sure (laughs) what that's going to look like going forward, but we do know it will be a no-touch character experience (laughs) (laughs) it's my new favorite phrase for sure (laughs) now moving on down the road if you're heading toward the safari on the left you come to kusafiri bakery and coffee shop which is normally my go-to place if i need a little little something something to get me going in the morning kusafiri incidentally means to journey Right now, I believe this stand is closed, but when it's open, you can get breakfast, sandwiches, pastries, fruit, and yogurt. They also have beverages, including Joffrey's coffee options. And if you're feeling like a party in the morning, you can make it an Irish coffee. And I I don't mean by adding Baileys to it. They actually throw in a shot of Jameson Irish whiskey and top it off with whipped cream. Medicine, indeed. There's no monkeying around here. 
at Animal Kingdom. Not with Patrick, the drinks. Patrick. You're very welcome. <laughs> Very welcome. And then for lunch, they swap out the breakfast sandwiches for shrimp or chicken curry. Now, just across from here, sort of in the middle of the strip, there's a little stage where under safer conditions, you'll be entertained by live African drummers, singers, and dancers. And truly, they are wonderful to watch and listen to. Fingers crossed that they will return one day. I believe they were some of the first of the entertainment to be let go uh, during the pandemic. So hopefully something like them or they will return. Uh, They are a joy in every sense of the word. They are able to get even the crankiest of person to join in on the dancing there. So fingers crossed, everybody. Now, just up from there on the right, you'll come to the Mombasa Market, where you'll find African and safari-themed merch, much of which you can only get here within Disney World. They used to have a woodcarver sitting right outside selling little trinkets. Hopefully, he or she will return at some point. Now, I assume Mombasa is in reference to the city in Kenya, which would fit in with the area here of Africa that the village represents. And connected is Ziwani Traders, where you'll find more plush, housewares, some pins, I believe, and Disney apparel. And Ziwani is another town within Kenya. Next up, we come to one of my favorite places, which will be a surprise to nobody, Zuri's Sweet Shop, which I think is connected. I believe you can get there from within Ziwani Traders. If not, it's just around the corner. And here you can get some amazing sweets like enormous Adam blocks of fudge, cookies, cakes, brownies, and candy. You'll also find cookbooks, trail mix, wine glasses, and a few mugs, some of which, again, I believe you can only get here in Animal Kingdom. I highly recommend going into this shop. It's super cute, and it has a fun story, actually, about Miss Zuri, who is a resident of Harambe, who started her business years ago and is now helping the other women of Harambe start their own businesses within the community. All over the shop, you'll find photos of Miss Zuri and learn about her story. Have we talked about enough food? I don't know. No. Fantastic, because <laughs> because <laughs> just outside of the main entrance for Zuri's, you'll find the enormous Harambe Market. Now here is where you're going to find a collection of stands serving African-themed quick-service meals like the ribs and chicken bowl, the Harambe chicken salad, and a plant-based sausage bowl. You can also get beer, soda, juice, and water, and specialty cocktails like the Serengeti Sangria or the Leopard's Eye with vodka, passion fruit, mango, and kiwi juice. There's lots of seating here and right now i believe you can only enter if you have a mobile order that is ready to be picked up and finally just before we get to the animals we come to some more food at the harambe fruit market now this is not a gay club it's actually a food stand (laughs) in case you were confused with lots of fruits and veggie options and ice cream hot dogs and mickey pretzels also, incidentally, just across from here, before you enter the safari, you'll find what's called a path less traveled tour. This would be the check-in spot if you have booked a behind-the-scenes tour for an up-close encounter with the animals in the safari. All right, Adam, are you ready, finally, for the main attraction within Harambe? Absolutely. I can't wait. So basically, Patrick, we've made a loop essentially, right? And now we're going back up towards the safari. We've done basically a circle of almost all of the the food carts and shops and restaurants. And now we're heading back up into where the safari is, which is the furthest northmost point of this portion. Yes, my belly is full. I have (laughs) some fudge in my pocket for the safari. Let's do it. Perfect. Perfect. Well, just in time, Adam, we have come to the Kilimanjaro safari. I think this is one of my absolute must-dos while I'm in Disney, and especially in Animal Kingdom. Here is where you will board an open-air vehicle tour of the Harambe Wildlife Reserve, which is the home to 34 species of animals who roam 110 acres. Now, just for perspective, you can fit the Magic Kingdom inside of the Kilimanjaro safari with room to grow. It's absolutely, absolutely enormous, and rightfully so, because these animals need to be protected. Now, just as a fun fact, long before Walt Disney World was even built, Walt Disney wanted to include actual African animals on the Jungle Cruise, which was quite simply not going to work. (laughs) (laughs) 
but it was widely known that Walt Disney, in fact, had a passion for animals and for conservation. So the safari was basically built as a tribute to Walt Disney himself. It serves as a major educational element within the park, as well as a major element in Disney's goal to preserve and rehabilitate many of the endangered species that are native to Africa. Just some of the animals you will encounter are rhinos, cheetahs, giraffe, crocodiles, elephants, hyenas, flamingos, hippos, and Gary the Gay Ostrich. He's there. He's there. He will absolutely stop all of it so mm-hmm. that you stare at him for at least 20 minutes. I have been on a safari where he has absolutely stood in the middle of the road for about 15 minutes. Just just giving you the side eye. What a showboating queen. Love him. Love him. Another fun fact, as you pass Flamingo Island within the safari, the island itself is actually a giant hidden Mickey. Oh, I didn't know that. It is. You can you can actually see it. Um, if you look at the Animal Kingdom map, you can see that it is shaped like a Mickey. Those Imagineers. They know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. Now, I personally recommend when they are available, Glenn, if you have the time and the funds, book one of the tours that you can take either backstage or on the safari itself. You will not soon forget it. I did the Up Close with Rhinos tour, and I've talked about it many years ago here on the podcast, it feels like. <laughs> <laughs> and it was it was truly a life-changing experience that I will never, never, never forget. So, as if that wasn't enough animals to take in, as soon as you leave the safari, you can walk right on into the Gorilla Falls Exploration Trail. This is a lot like the Maharaja Jungle Trek, only this one is, of course, filled with African wildlife. All along the path, you'll find informational markers, as well as Disney cast members who are there to teach you all about the animals. You'll get up close and personal with exotic birds, mole rats, hippos, meerkats, and of course, a family of gorillas. It is absolutely stunning and and worth taking your time to take it all in. Take a million photos and learn about some exotic animals there. Please do that, please, because that is the real reason behind Animal Kingdom, right, is for us to encounter these incredible creatures that we share this planet with. For sure. It is, it's, you, I learn something new every time I'm on the safari or within these, these treks, and it's never the same experience twice, because, I mean, they're, anim- they're live animals, uh, and, and they're there for, for you to learn about really, and to help protect. So now, after spending a few hours with these amazing animals, it's time to head over to the Harambe Theater to watch people dressed up like animals. Some of them, and I don't want to objectify them, (laughs) but some of them are just so, so attractive. I mean, I think all of them. I think all of them are. I, I wouldn't push any of these animals out of my bedroom. <laughs> That's a weird. It took weird a turn. To it did take mm-hmm. a turn. <laughs> it did take a turn. Now this is, <laughs> I will say, I think my favorite live show in Disney World called Festival of the Lion King, which will be returning this summer, or so we're told, at least. So let's pretend it's back, right? Nothing happened. It was never closed. Look over there. The show is basically (laughs) a celebration of the animated movie, The Lion King, in a theater in the round setting. The premise is that you are invited to take part in a celebration with King Simba and his friends, narrated by a troupe of four performers, Kiyume, Nakawa, Kibibi, and Zawadi, all Swahili words for masculine, good-looking, princess, and the gift, respectively. It's it's kind of a mini Cirque show, right? With acrobats, stilt walkers, dancers, singers, and a fire dancer. All performing songs from The Lion King, like I Just Can't Wait to Be King, Hakuna Matata, Can You Feel the Love Tonight, and Be Prepared, and of course, The Circle of Life. Now for me, the coolest part of the show are the enormous floats with larger-than-life versions of an elephant, a giraffe, Pumbaa, the warthog, and of course, Simba. As a fun fact, these floats were originally used in Disneyland as part of the Lion King Celebration Parade, and I believe... Technically, the four animals are actually puppets because they can be controlled and manipulated live rather than as a computer program. Now, they are absolutely stunning to see. And the show in general always makes me laugh and cry and dance and sing. It's, it's just it's 25 minutes of pure energy and love and joy. And I just can't wait to see it again. 
Adam. I just can't wait to see it again, too. You know what's so successful about this show to me is that it's not trying to replicate the story of The Lion King. It is something completely different. It's more just about listening to the music and celebrating along with your friends as opposed to telling a real story. And I think that's where it's so successful is that, you know, it's, it is it is truly a celebration and not just a retelling of the story. Yeah, absolutely. It's not The Lion King. It's, it's simply in the title. It is a festival of The Lion King, and it's worth your time. Go see it more than once, I would say, because you'll see different singers swapped in and out, and they're all, they're all wonderful and have something unique to bring to the show. And with that, that pretty much wraps up Africa slash Harambe, with the exception Adam, of the Wildlife Express train, which will take you to your favorite part in all of Disney World, I would say, Rafiki's Planet Watch. I love Rafiki's Planet Watch. (laughs) I can tell. I can tell by by the way you read that direct from a script. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but you mentioned the Wildlife Express train, and that's how you get, yes, to Rafiki's Planet Watch. The Wildlife Express train is a peaceful, well, I mean, it depends on how many kids are on it, right? But it's a, <laughs> it's a seven-minute, 1.2-mile journey on a rustic locomotive, and it gives guests a close-up look at the inner workings of Disney's Animal Kingdom because you travel past animal housing and veterinary facilities for rhinos, elephants, and more. And then after you experience Rafiki's Planet Watch, you need to board the Wildlife Express train again for your ride back to Harambe, Africa. So the train is taking you to Rafiki's Planet Watch, which is home to delightful exhibits. Those are Disney's words for animal aficionados featuring three areas, an affection section, habitat, habitat, and conservation station. The affection section is an expansive outdoor space, which provides an opportunity to meet a variety of unique domesticated animals and interact with the park's animal care experts. This is parents with kids who love animals, the only petting zoo in Walt Disney World. So if that's very important to your kids to get that up close and personal with the animals, this is where you're going to want to go. Maybe not you as adults, but your kids are absolutely going to love it. I promise you. Habitat Habit. Did I say Habitat Habitat before? You did. You did indeed. Oh, well, it's actually called Habitat Habit, people. It's an outdoor discovery trail, I guess. Not really. I mean, it's like a mini version of the oasis kind of at the front of the park. And it also consists of a tiny collection of signs about wildlife. And there's a few animals in there and that leads you to conservation station. So it's, it's barely an experience, but it's there. (laughs) So there's that. There is that. There we go. Conservation station is animal kingdoms, veterinary and conservation headquarters Guests can meet wildlife experts, observe ongoing projects, and learn about behind-the-scenes operations at the park. The station also serves as a rehabilitation center for injured animals, and it includes a nursery, so adorable, for recently born or hatched critters. And Conservation Station actually consists of five sections. There's a veterinary treatment room. It doesn't treat vets, but it does treat animals. Guests get a close-up look at the place where the park's animals, experts, and vets care for the animals. You also can glimpse a procedure in process, right, Patrick? So this is where the operations take place. Yes, it's really fascinating. I I, I can't confirm or deny whether or not it is still up and running right now or whether you can still watch the operations. Um, but when it is up and running, um, usually there's a schedule posted of like what animals can be worked on today that you can that you can observe. Yeah. And these procedures include non-essential operations too, like eye lifts and mm. Botox injections for the animals, a Brazilian butt lift. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Lots of lots of tummy tucks. So many tummy tucks for all the new mommies in Animal <laughs> Kingdom. You know what? They've earned it, Patrick. And the daddies. And the daddies. And the daddies, too, if they want one, too. And me. I've, I've been known to get a few, a few lifts and, and, and just some general snatching done there at the, what's it called? The conversation. <laughs> <laughs> the veterinary treatment room. <laughs> there it is. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> just some general snatching, huh? Just some real basic, real basic snatching. Yeah, you should know that if you do want surgery, you do need to purchase a ticket to the park in order to have surgery that day. 
It is an extra ticketed event. For it, sure. it is. It is about seventy five dollars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's also a nutrition center where guests can watch experts prepare meals for the animals. There are amphibian, reptile, and invertebrate windows where you can see. Oh, why would you? Tarantulas, scorpions, millipedes, and snakes. Gross. Just gross. Ish. And there's a science center where you can check out what the park's resident scientists are working on. And last but not least, and a relatively new addition, and probably a reason to draw people into this area of the park, I would imagine, is the animation experience, which provides information about the history of Disney animation and gives guests a chance to draw a character with the help of a live instructor, very similar to what you can experience at Disney California Adventure. Yes, it's it's a lot of fun. If you if you haven't done one of these animation experiences, I recommend doing it. At least try it out once. Very fun. I think you'll surprise yourself with how accurately you'll be able to draw. They really do a good job of kind of walking you through the experience. And with that, Patrick, we can wrap up our visit to Rafiki's Planet Watch. <laughs> we can indeed. We might as well just end the episode because that was the most exciting part of it. Yeah. <laughs> not adam's favorite not adam's favorite all right so <laughs> so we've taken the train back into harambe we are circling back to where the harambe theater is and heading into pandora which is a land inspired by james cameron's movie avatar now the land itself is set a full generation after the events of the movie on pandora the land opened on january 10th 2014. Interestingly, part of the appeal of building this land was in part due to the massive success of the movie Avatar and because of the planned sequels that were supposed to have happened already. As of right now, the next three movies are potentially coming out in 2022, 2024, and 2028. I do not want to explore the math of how old I will be once this franchise has come to an end. You will need a walker to go to the theater to see that movie. <laughs> it's true. I will no longer be able to ride the attractions within, <laughs> <laughs> within Pandora. So what's neat about Pandora is that it is Animal Kingdom's version of another planet, basically. The focus is on conservation and living in harmony with the native inhabitants of the planet, the Navi. So there are two entrances into Pandora, one from Africa, if you follow the path that we are on right now, and one from Discovery Island if you pass Tiffin's and the Nome mad lounge currently i believe the path from africa is closed due to the social distance extended line for flight of passage which does indeed extend all the way into africa but we are going to assume and pretend that it's open and walk right in from where we are so fun fact though it seems like both entrances are on opposite ends of the world they actually both spill you roughly into the same spot which is a really beautiful water feature with bioluminescent plants and creatures that make their home on pandora I can personally spend a lot of time in this specific spot, especially at night when it's all lit up and glowing. From here, though, we are going to do a circle of the land, heading first toward the Satuli Canteen. We're just going to start eating right away, Adam. Well, it's been a good 20 minutes since our last meal. It has been, and that was spent entirely on a one-way trip to Rafiki's Planet Watch. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, they're going to do something with it, I promise. They're going to fix it. They're going to fix it. <laughs> now, for, for my money, Satuli Canteen is for sure a top three quick service within Disney World. The premise of the restaurant is that it's an old mess hall from long ago, now owned and operated by Alpha Centauri Expeditions, which is your host company while on Pandora. The menu consists of healthy options grown locally on Pandora. In real life, it's basically grain and vegetable bowls that you can build by picking your grain, your veggies, your protein, and your sauce. It's, 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 it's Chipotle, right? It's Chipotle <laughs> on another planet. It's Pandora Chipotle. It's Pandora Chipotle. <laughs> I, now, I personally, I think the meals are really good here, and, and they're healthy and filling and at quick service prices. You can also get cheeseburger steamed pods, which are basically the cheeseburger spring rolls from Magic Kingdom, but in a bao bun. For dessert, they have a chocolate cake, or my favorite, the blueberry cream cheese mousse. And, of course, they have waters, sodas, juice, milk, and specialty wines and beers, like the Banshee Chardonnay, Hawk's Grog Ale, Dreamwalker Sangria, and the Mayora High Country Ale. 
The food is not only delicious here, but it's also beautiful, and it's served on actual dishes with actual silverware, which I have to say is a nice touch. Yeah, going back to that mess hall theme that you mentioned, right? Like that would be something you would experience in a mess hall. (laughs) I'm pretty messy after I've eaten here, that's for sure. Do they provide you with a banshee bib? (laughs) I need one. I'm usually wearing my Eaton dress by this point, so... You know, I'm prepared. I'm prepared for sure. Now, just outside of Satuli Canteen is Pangu Pangu, which is basically a walk-up bar with some food. For breakfast, they do serve breakfast sandwiches. And at lunch and dinner, you can get giant, giant pretzels or a Pangu Lumpaya, which is a spring roll filled with pineapple and cream cheese. Now, a lot of people are turned off by this, but I find it super good and super refreshing. It's it's served chilled, I believe, right now. So, so tasty. Yes. So tasty. And for drinks, they have a few beers and the Rum Blossom, which is rum with apple and pear limeade topped with passion fruit boba balls, which are basically tiny jello balls. They also have the Mayora Margarita with tequila, blue curacao, and lime juice, and the Night Blossom, which is the non-alcoholic version of the Rum Blossom. Now, moving right along, on our way to the entrance for Flight of Passage, we come to one of my favorite photo spots, a beautiful waterfall cascading from the floating mountains. Take a moment take a photo here. It's it's very reminiscent, I have to say, of this planet's version of Hawaii. It makes you feel like you're on a tropical island here. That's a great comparison, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now, this brings us to the Flight of Passage, which is a 3D flight simulator that takes you on a flight through Pandora on the back of a banshee, which is a native, for lack of a better word, dragon. I would say, right? (laughs) Yeah, dragon, for sure. (laughs) For sure. Though I must say, I would call this a 4D experience based on the physical elements that happen on the ride. The premise of the ride, true to Animal Kingdom, is based around an attempt to revitalize the Banshee population on Pandora. You are told that through Alpha Centauri Expedition's technology, they can link you to a Navi avatar and fly on a Banshee. I won't lie, I don't really know what any of that means. I don't know the premise (laughs) of the movie Avatar. It doesn't make sense to me. But (laughs) what I do know is this is absolutely an amazing attraction. Once you are fully on and literally strapped into the attraction, you fully feel like you're riding on an animal and flying through the wilderness. You're fully immersed in a 3D environment with a scentscape, and the ride vehicle itself is designed to seem as though you can feel the Banshee breathing in and out as you're on it. Interestingly, Disney has not fully disclosed what's actually happening here on the ride, likely due to the fact that they are in fact using some proprietary inventions. If you're an X-Men fan, it sort of feels like you're entering Cerebro when you get on the ride. Yeah, I Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I I do, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Now I'll say that Disney has fully acknowledged that if you have a fear of heights or are uncomfortable being restrained, this is is simply not the attraction for you. You you will likely get a little queasy on the ride. There, there are multiple times, in fact, during the queue where you are warned that you should not get on the attraction if any of that applies to you. Now, Adam, talk to me about your experience with the Flight of Passage. I actually can get a little queasy on simulators, but this isn't that. This is a different experience. And I think, Patrick, it's because you're so in the open on this ride, both literally and you're in the open in the story of the ride. And then on top of that, they seem to be blowing air on your face, right? And they give you a Navi guide to watch. So all of that in combination kind of helps me not get motion sickness. And I've had other friends too, Bart, you know, our friend Bart, who went on this ride, who is very susceptible to motion sickness, didn't feel a thing. So it's very successfully done. It's a beautiful moving experience and one that is not to be missed. I would agree hundred percent. Everything you said, absolutely true. The cue leading up to it is absolutely beautiful. You could spend a million years there and, and see something new all the time. It's, it's great. It's just a fantastic fantastic attraction. Highly recommended. If you can get on it, get on it. As you exit, of course, there is a gift shop here where you can purchase many things you don't need that are <laughs> um, Avatar themed. You can you can get a Navi costume 
uh, which is actually kind of cute. I almost considered buying one of the tails. They're adorable. <laughs> <laughs> and you can buy a highly coveted banshee that will sit on your shoulder and you can manipulate like a puppet. They are wildly expensive and wildly adorable. Okay, so now <laughs> from here, we are going to move on to a ride that I have to say has very much grown on me. The Navi River Journey, which is basically the dark ride in Animal Kingdom, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think there are any other dark rides. Some may be screaming dinosaur is a dark ride, but I consider that a thrill ride. You heard it here, Tweedles. The line has been drawn. Dinosaur is, in fact, a thrill ride, not a dark ride. We're just correct. It's 100% true because we said it here. (laughs) Now, the Navi River Journey is a gentle and relaxing boat ride through the Kazvapan River in Pandora. Now, this is a fully immersive attraction with animatronics, an amazing soundscape, and incredible practical and visual effects. During the ride, you go through caves and a bioluminescent rainforest within Pandora, and the ride for lack of a better word, climaxes at the very end with an encounter with what I would say is the best animatronic that Disney has created to date, the shaman. She is enormous and beautiful and as lifelike as the person sitting next to you. A fun fact, the shaman is singing a song in the native Navi language, which was fully created by, and I mean this person fully created a new language. Uh, His name is Dr. Paul Frommer. Now, here's what I have to confess. Many people, myself included, kind of frowned upon this attraction at first. And in fact, I think we did here on the pod when we when we first experienced this new land. And I think for good reason. We had we had been waiting for this land to open for a few years, and when it opened, it was amazing. And we were all expecting to wait hours and hours for this epic new ride. And the Navi River Journey, though beautiful, was a boat ride that lasted about a minute and a half. And I can't I can't tell anyone to wait over an hour for this ride, but I can say that it's worth going on, if that makes sense. It does make sense. Yeah, I'm still kind of in the, it's beautiful, it's a nice little meditative moment kind of group when it comes to this ride. But what really is so great about this ride is that it gives families a chance to experience Pandora together, right? Like you're not going to be able to take your little, little ones on Flight of Passage. So this is a great opportunity to introduce them to pandora and give them a chance to be a part of that world yeah for sure it's it's very relaxing it's breathtakingly beautiful they're they're doing things that i didn't know were possible visually without having to need um 3d glasses you know what i mean and i believe someone correct me if i'm wrong i believe they actually slowed down the ride a little bit so you're on it for just a little bit longer and you can experience the sights for a a little bit longer so i may be wrong on that but it's that's what it felt like to me last time i was on it it felt like we were on it for maybe two and a half minutes instead of a minute and a half and and i saw a lot more on this ride so who can say who can say it's a quality experience and so meticulously themed like completely immersive so it's well worth your time but patrick's right if it's over an hour wait you maybe want to pass on it in any case for sure if you haven't done it though give it a try i think if you have done it and aren't the biggest of fans give it another try give it a second thought and and let us know your new thoughts about this ride because i it's growing on me for sure i think i like it more and more every time i'm there your number one underrated attraction in walt disney world right That's right. Absolutely. It is an underrated attraction, I think. And with that, we are finished, Adam, walking through Animal Kingdom. Ooh, that was quite the walk. (laughs) That was a beast. That was a beast to get through. A lot of information, a lot of exploring, a lot of learning, but it makes sense because Disney's Animal Kingdom is the largest of Disney's parks. It absolutely is. It absolutely is, which is always sort of an optical illusion to people. They don't really realize how massive animal kingdom is because there's not a ton of attractions it's not chock-a-block full of attractions the way that the magic kingdom is where every five steps there's a new attraction to go on it's just it's very expansive and there's so much to see here and along with that expanse comes incredible beauty the beauty of nature you are surrounded by beautiful trees and plants and flowers and then to have the on top of that the opportunity to learn about the animals and experience some really quality attractions makes disney's animal kingdom one of the best disney parks you can experience 
I would fully agree with that. I, I've said it many times in the podcast. It's quickly becoming my favorite theme park within Disney World. I think there's just so much to do and see here. And I think after a trip, some of my most significant memories are coming from the Animal Kingdom. Well, we would love to hear what you think makes Disney's Animal Kingdom so unique and so special. And in particular, what you think it is about Asia, Africa, Pandora, and yes, even Rafiki's Planet Watch, what you truly love about those experiences within the park, you can reach out to us on social media. That's Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at GDTD Podcast. Or you can leave us a voice memo or email at info at gazedothed.com. After this recording, Adam, I am going to make us some reservations for our October trip to get some uh, lip injections over on uh, Rafiki's Planet Watch. I have some additional procedures I'd like to mm. add on to that. Just tack them on if we can. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm on a budget, so so I think you're going to get the top lip injected and I'll get the bottom lip injected and we'll, we'll see what happens. Fascinating. What a pair we'll make. Yeah, we're going to look a lot like Amanda Limpour. <laughs> <laughs> You know? <laughs> hey, Adam. Hey, Patrick. By my estimation, we are three and a half hours into this episode, <laughs> which means it's time for some quick D, some more episode. Uh, it was time for a quick D an hour and a half ago, my friend. <laughs> it's always time for quick D. Always, always, always. And for our Tweedles at home who have never heard of quick D, it means you always stop listening halfway through the episode. So here we are. Let's pretend you're with us. This is where Adam and I ask each other a question we have not been privy to prior to recording, and we answer it off the cuff. Things can get silly. Things can get serious. You never know with quick D. It's true. We're doing some classic quick D people. This is how it all started. That's how it all started. Um, let's bring the drama today. What do you think? <laughs> I'm going for tears. Okay. Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, I, I don't know what that means, but I'm here for it. This is very exciting. You're going to find out. I, uh, <laughs> I have one of your loved ones here in my basement, Adam, and you have to decide. <laughs> oh God. It's like a saw situation, huh? It's a saw. It's a saw situation, <laughs> um, but only for your ears. So Let's see what happens. Adam, do you want to ask me a question first, or do you want me to harm one of your loved ones first? <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'd love to have you ask me a question first and not harm one of my loved ones, if possible, if you can restrain yourself. Got it. Got it. I am releasing your cousin Gertrude. You are free to go, <laughs> Gertrude. Thank you for your patience. Um, here we go. I have a question for you instead then, Adam. Fantastic. And hello to Gertie. <laughs> now, Adam, it's simply, it's simply a fact that you hate Dinoland USA God. with a passion. You think it was a mistake, never oh. should have happened. Oh. Mm -hmm. It's just a fact. Everyone knows it. But Adam, the world wants to know then, if you're so smart, what are we replacing Dinoland USA with? Tell me all about it. What should go there instead? Well, I mean, as I said, I think earlier in this recording, we could do Zootopia Land, which is going to Shanghai Disney. You know, like, why not throw that in there? It covers the animal element needed, and it also is a wildly successful movie. So it seems like a perfect fit for Dino Land USA, don't you think? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think you can do better. Something else. Give me something else. <laughs> okay. Sure. Um... What if we took that area, maybe expanded a little bit more, and did a South America section of Animal Kingdom? Ooh, I like this. Adding a new continent, really. Yeah, or how about Antarctica? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That could be difficult to do in Florida, but okay. You know what? The Imagineers are very bright. They'll figure it out. I want <laughs> a dome built, a cooled dome that you can enter, and they provide you with Disney-branded parkas, and you can look at penguins, and you can look at 
other animals that may exist in Antarctica. <laughs> Antarctica. Ka, ka, ka. Perhaps a polar bear? Probably not there. But I, are uh, they in North? Are they in the North Pole? I don't know where the polar bears are. They're on a pole. They're on someone's pole. Okay, so that's an option too, don't you think? I think that's a great option. I like this. An, an ice bar perhaps could be there as well. An ice bar. Always bring it back to drinking and buying drinks because that's how Disney makes their money. What mm-hmm. if there was a quick service location serving penguin? <laughs> um, I'm not fully sold on that idea. I think you need to workshop it a smidge. I feel like it's a winner. Mm. Mm, not super, not super in line with um, conservation. But listen, listen, this is this is how dreams are made with big mistakes. <laughs> I'm just right? blue skying here, Patrick. I mean, <laughs> this is this is yeah, this is this is workshopping an idea. That's what it's called. Got it. You uh, you workshopped those penguins right right to death, didn't you? I certainly did. Delicious, packed with protein. Those are my three options for you. Zootopia, <laughs> South America, mm. Antarctica, serving penguins at a quick service cart. All three of those options are winners. Okay. I'm thinking uh, we have to go back to Zootopia because um, we don't want penguins to die, I guess, is the only reason that Zootopia is a winner. That's fine. I think Zootopia is a great, a great choice. Missing out on the penguins, yes. But <laughs> you know what? Zootopia, great film. So I'm on board. All right, let's do it. Let's make it happen. I like it. Zootopia it is. All right, Patrick, here's my question for you. Similar vein, Patrick, Mm. to what you asked Mm -hmm. me. But as we mentioned in our feature segment, you know, the Asia area of Disney's Animal Kingdom has that giant amphitheater just kind of sitting there. 5,000 seats sitting empty, just waiting to be filled with some kind of new show, experience, what have you. What are we going to put in that space, Patrick? I think it seems clear that we need a drag show to happen (laughs) within Animal Kingdom, simply called Animal Queendom Work. (laughs) Okay, this is a fantastic idea. We're getting a drag show. What do you envision that being like? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So all of the contestants need to celebrate the queens of Disney, not the Animal King's. The animal queens. So not not human queens, not the princesses, not Anna or Elsa. I'm talking about Sarabi. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about Maiden Marian. Mm-hmm. All in drag form, though. Okay. And these are animals in drag? These are humans in drag as animal ladies. Got it. So we're going for like a Festival of the Lion King vibe, but just drag. 100%. 100%. I'm thinking Marie from the Aristocats. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Perdita from 101 Dalmatians. I mean, Clarabelle Cow is our MC, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fabulous. I love this idea. This is a great idea. I know, because it came out of my mouth. How do you plan to incorporate the screams from Expedition Everest right across the way? <laughs> That's a great question. We're still we're still thinking about that, but we are going to incorporate a lot, a lot of fans into the situation. And by a fan, I mean the fans. Always work in the merchandise to the show, right? Always be selling. Always be selling. And of course, the winner of Animal Kingdom work gets their <laughs> own <laughs> gets their own show atop a float on the Rivers of Light Amphitheater Lagoon. Serious stakes here. <laughs> There's a lot, a lot at stake here. And frankly, when you get your own show, it's a bit of a risk, too, because you're on a float. If you fall off, you're in one foot of water, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) That will do it for this episode of Gays Do the D. Thanks for listening. To become a patron of the podcast, visit our website at gaysdothed.com slash donate. For a donation of any amount, you can receive exclusive Gaze Do the D content and help us continue to bring you the very best Disney news and discussion. Continue the conversation after this episode on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at GDTD Podcast and submit your questions or show ideas to info at gazedothed.com. Have a great week, everybody. See you real soon. <laughs>